I'll tell you, I'll I'll jump in because we we just have you and and you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Homer Hickam, and Homer is the author of Rocket Boys, which later turned into October Sky, which many of you know um, was one of my first major motion pictures. So Homer and I go way way back, and it's such an honor to have you. Like it really is, and I brought you up to the guys, and they were so excited. So. Thank you for making time and coming to talk with um, these G Crew Rocket Boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to do it, uh, Chad. I'm always excited to talk to you, of course, and the rest of the crew there. And I went back and looked at some of the some of your previous podcasts, and uh, you look like you're having a lot of fun. So, uh, and, I, and I like to have a lot of fun. So let's do it. Yeah, man. Um, well, t- I mean. <sighs> Man, where do we even start? You know, um, I guess, like, how did Rocket Boys come about for you? I mean, I, that was, like, your childhood. That was everything. Like, I know very well. <laughs> but, like, for our listeners and and everybody that, that I know that, I mean, I who hasn't seen October Sky? You know what I mean? Who hasn't, like, come across this movie? So, I, I guess, how how did it all start for you? Yeah, yeah. I like to say every substitute teacher in the world shows October Sky, you know, because I hear from the kids. It's like, if I watch this movie one more time in class, I'm going to seek out Chad Lindbergh. <laughs> but um, now how this came about was kind of kind of curious um, uh, in that um, I was already a writer, but I was working for NASA at that time. I'd written a previous book called uh, Torpedo Junction which had done really well. It was about the U-boats. I'm a scuba instructor, and I did all kinds of research. And, uh, by the way, I was uh, helping this um, this uh, uh, insurance agent in Maryland was writing uh, a book about submarines the same time that I was back. This was back in the uh, 1980s. And um, he called me, and we talked about what he was doing and so on. And I thought, uh, this guy didn't have a prayer of everything this book published. <laughs> and... Um, we ended up with the same publisher as Naval Institute Press, uh, and uh, his name, you might recognize it, was Tom Clancy. Oh, hell. And I have a first edition of uh, Hunt for Red October with Tom Clancy's note in it about, thank you for helping me, Homer, blah, blah. So if, if, you, if you will know that I'm dead, when that book hits eBay, yeah, <laughs> my wife about one week to get there. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so uh, I'd written this book and then I was real busy um, with NASA. I'd gone off to Japan and trained Japanese astronauts and all that, which was a lot of fun. And um, but I wanted to keep writing, so I uh, I was uh, got a call from the editor of Smithsonian Air and Space Magazine, and she wanted to just. I'd written some other stuff for him, and she said, uh, just write me, a, you know, 2,000 words, Homer. I need it by tomorrow. And I went, sure. And then I went, what am I going to write it about? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked across on my desk, and I had one little artifact left from when I was in West Virginia, and I built rockets. And I thought, well, Aaron Space Magazine. So I called Pat Trenner, his name of the editor, and told her what I had in mind. And she was completely, totally, utterly underwhelmed with this idea. <laughs> But I did it anyway. I just cranked it out real fast. And I, then I started remembering, oh, Miss Riley, her teacher, and the other boys. And it's like, it's not a bad little story here. So when it hit, uh, when it came out, my phone almost melted down. And who should be come calling but New York publishers and Hollywood. And um, so actually, uh, I don't know if you remember. Uh, well, uh, I, I started writing this. So that's ni- 1996 when that happened. Wow. I started writing the book. I uh, got about 200 pages in into it, and I was writing it from the perspective of a NASA engineer, you know, done pretty well, and and was looking back, and I and I got to that point and I went, this sucks, this totally sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I like it, and nobody else is going to like it, so I threw it away, started all over again. You have to do that as a writer sometimes, and this time I wrote it from the perspective of that 14 through 17 year old boy. I had I had a channel. Uh, I was known as Sonny, little Sonny Hickam. And I like to say I got a million dollars worth of psychotherapy. I didn't even know I needed it when I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
And I, they had a big auction in New York and Hollywood, you know, went crazy and in Universal. And it's like, oh, man, this this is great. I wish I wasn't 55. I wish I was 25. And I was <laughs> right. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's, how the, that's how the book came. And if you'll remember, the book wasn't, wasn't even published when we made the movie. It actually, right. there was a race between the publisher and Universal Studio as to who would get it out first. Well, uh, we did. The publisher, Random House, got it out in um, like early October of, um, gosh, what year was that? 1998. And then the, the movie came out on my birthday, February the 19th. That's uh, right. 1999. That's and he started filming. Started filming on my birthday. So that's crazy. That? But, you know, it's just like, oh, man. Um, I don't know if you remember, Chad, or, or not, but we, that movie is supposed to take about a month to do. And it took. Yeah. Three months. Three months. <laughs> <laughs> About three months, right? Like, yeah, yeah, I remember. Three months. Yeah. We were in o- Oak Ridge. Yeah, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Oak Ridge, Tennessee, in right. the middle and, of uh, awful nowhere. It was known before that for building the atomic bomb. They put it out where there was nobody. And <laughs> there's still nobody <laughs> when we made right. it. There was a Walmart. And any time I was kind of wondering where Chad was, and I asked anybody, they said he was uh, down at the Walmart meeting the Tennessee girls. Wow. <laughs> that a boy. Uh, yeah. all, four, all four of us, all four of us, were. We, there was a 24-hour Walmart, literally, like, right next to the hotel. So, yeah. like, we would literally take our per diem and go to the Walmart. All, all four of us, really. But Jake was really kind of, like, honing in, and he was he was doing his thing a lot of the time. But, like, the three of us were always at Walmart. 16. He was only 16. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, so, so, and he he was in high school, and he had to take high school classes. Him so, and Chris. Chris yeah. Owen. Yes. Oh, with Chris, too? I didn't know that. Though. Yeah, yeah, because he had his dad there with him as well. Okay. So so Chad and Will Scott were down at the Walmart picking up the Tennessee girls. And I just had to say, those girls have an annual reunion and they they, they chant. <laughs> and they they hope someday that you will turn up. Oh man. <laughs> they begged me, you know, is Chad ever coming back? And I go, Oh yeah, he's coming. And here's his phone number. To yeah. <laughs> Man, I was, um, I was 21, 20. I had just turned kind of like a fresh 21, me and Will. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Like you say, you started writing this in 96. That's when that's, no, I graduated in 95. I moved to LA in 96 and it's really awesome. And I mean, like, I just have goosebumps even talking to you because it, it really does it, it, it brings back so much for me and that movie I'm always, always going to have these feelings with, but like, it's, I don't know. It's, I forgot where I was going. I got wrapped up in the, I got so excited. What was I <laughs> saying? You kept, you, kept doing that on set. you kept, huh? on, you kept doing that on set too. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, man. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, oh yeah. But I was saying that because you followed your dreams, like I was able to connect and follow my dreams and, and like, there's always going to be that connection. So I just thank you for doing that. I loved you guys. You, you, you're like family to me. Uh, everybody uh, on that set was a real, I think it was a pretty tight set. We had had some arguments with Joe Johnston, but hey, doesn't everybody? And <laughs> you know. I, oh, and I got kicked off set <laughs> once, and I think unofficially twice. <laughs> and that actually wasn't Ted's fault. It was Laura Dern's fault. Because Laura Baron wanted a bigger part in that movie. And so I wouldn't know. It's like Laura Dern would like to see you in her trailer. Now, who would turn this down? <laughs> I go over to Laura Dern. She's waving the script at me and says, I don't think Miss Riley would really talk like that. I've read part of your book. Because uh, I'd, I'd given the manuscript out and I went, I'm, I agree with you, Laura. I agree with everything you have to say. So, <laughs> So in her next meeting with the producers, <laughs> as I later heard, uh, they said every other word out of her mouth, Homer, was, well, Homer said. <laughs> <laughs> he said, we don't have to let you on the set. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to do the right thing. you know. So, so anyway, I got invited back, and uh, Laura, Laura did get a, little, a few more lines, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was all fun, and and um, uh, Oak Ridge was fun, and that little town of Petros. Do you remember Petros? 
Oh, uh, that, was, was yeah, that? that was where the tipple was, where they built the tipple, the coal mine. Oh, the coal mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and machine shop. And uh, you you maybe not did not have that many scenes there. I'm trying to think. You had the machine shop scene. At the machine shop, like, like one or two. Yeah, yeah. Like when we were building the rockets and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, you recognize that? Wow. Oh, my God. Yeah. Is that the Ock One. Yeah, that's the Ock One. And, um, I think in one of the scenes, you're, for no apparent reason, <laughs> messing with the <laughs> next. <laughs> but, uh, of course, this is on its way back to Universal. It's been. Oh, my way God. Way oh, that's there. the real one from the movie. Yeah, it's from the real one. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow, that's cool. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. Somehow, I, the prop man gave it to me. And I, I don't know. Anyway, I have it. You can expect to see that also on the. On eBay, <laughs> <laughs> I need to autograph it. I need to have you autograph it, and uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be my honor. Yeah. By the way, Chad uh, came up to West Virginia uh, for one of the rock. We boys. did, and oh my yeah. god, I love you. I mean, I got elbowed aside so often with Chad there, <laughs> and, <all> the girls. <laughs> and so uh, if you ever fall onto hard times, Chad, yeah. And, and you're homeless and you're wandering the streets, just somehow get your get yourself to West by God, Virginia, knock on the door, and they take you in. Promise. Uh, <laughs> well, I love it there. I love West Virginia. And we had fun. It was amazing to go see like to go be at this festival and see like all of the people that show up for the October Sky Festival. I mean it was or it was a Rocket Boy Festival, right? Yeah, we, we were. Yeah, when it started in Colwood, the actual real town. I'm sorry you never got to see the actual real town. I know. I know. For about uh, 14 years, and it was called the October Sky Festival, and they held it in October. And um, then um, the a bigger uh, Colwood uh, got so small and really couldn't do it anymore. And also the school buses couldn't get across the mountains and everything. It's pretty remote. Um, and uh, so it moved to the bigger town of Beckley which is uh, at the crossroads, got interstates and all that kind of good stuff. So, so it went on there. Last year was supposed, supposedly our last one. Um, and we'll see. Um, they'd like to do it some more. Uh, we have a, a musical rock called Rocket Boys the Musical held in Beckley um, every, every summer. And so that's going to be uh, in July. And maybe we kind of combine things there. And, hey, maybe you can get a part in it. You can play my dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As for singing voice, I, I don't think you ever had. I it's never, terrible. No, it's terrible. On. No, no, it's I, terrible. I, I, no, get a voice coach. Go for it, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, Nick, how about it? Do you want to sing? Do you want to be a? Do you want to audition for Rocket Boys and Musical? Oh, absolutely. We could be the G crew of Rocket Boys. New generation coming up. Absolutely. <laughs> I think it would be amazing. And, and, you know, speaking of like Chad, seriously, if you ever do go homeless, like, like you, Homer saying over here, just right back to the Walmart, man. And the Tennessee yeah, girl. There it is. <laughs> Walmart, Tennessee girls. That's it. Yeah. I mean, those girls are a, a little older now and they probably got, jealous husbands. I don't know. That's all right. We're, we're all older too. <laughs> <laughs> we're just aging in reverse. We're going back. Yeah. Yeah. Time. <laughs> so funny i loved that film i still remember where i was when i first saw that film it was incredible and and knowing that i was going to go through my journey in my life and all of us had separate courses to take but then chad and i we crossed paths eventually became really good friends it's just it's crazy you never know where you're going to be and then where we're all going to communicate like this <laughs> in different places <laughs> in the world in a, in a wild world we're living in right now right so it shows such an interesting time. And and I love stuff like this because we're all coming together, communicating and talking about the past and the history and where films came from, but where the realism came from, too, from you, Homer. I mean, it's it's amazing. It's amazing to hear the stories. Well, of course, uh, the book was um, filtered through the brain of Lewis Kolick. He was the screenplay writer. He was an A-list writer. I think he still is. And um, that really helped get some of the actors uh, like Chad and so on, on board because he was a list. And, you, you know, usually it takes uh, from at least five years, maybe 10 years for a book to actually be made into a movie. And then, and then, uh, and then done uh, this, this movie for some reason got on a real fast track. It was pretty amazing. And um, 
people always, you know, they go, oh, Homer, you've written a lot of other books. Uh, when are they going to make movies out of it? It's like, I think I've had my Hollywood miracle. They're kind of <laughs> <laughs> I would love it. Yeah, of course, all my books would make great movies. But in fact, it's really, really difficult for uh, any any book to be ma- made into a movie or any movie to be made. The truth is no, a, a major motion picture. So, uh, yeah, it. Um, uh, I loved it. It was a lot of fun. I don't count on it. I don't, you know, I, I live here in Alabama. Uh, I guess if I really wanted to make a career out of it, I'd live out in California or up in New York. Uh, a career in terms of uh, getting movies made. Uh, we got some Alabama mosquitoes here coming out. So, <laughs> uh, But, <laughs> but um, uh, I love, I, I, you know, it's kind of hard to, 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 um, to get better than 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 perfect, and um, but it is impossible to get better than perfect. But I think that movie was perfectly made. I think that it has, but it had a far more impact and influence than we expected it. Mm-hmm. I would say more engineers and scientists have been uh, created because of that movie. They they uh, kids who weren't even interested in any kind of technology. They see that movie and um, they all of a sudden want to be an engineer. They want to be a scientist, but also though a lot of kids see it and it's like, okay, if, if those idiots in West Virginia can do this, obviously I can too. And so it's great, great hope and inspiration uh, about it. And I hear, I still hear from them every day. I get letters every day. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. It is amazing. How many movies, how many movies have that influence on, on people across the world. I hear from China, from India, from Argentina, from, from just uh, Nigeria, everywhere. Um, kids see this movie and they, they are so energized by it. And, and, and they, you know, come to me, of course, all the girls are always disappointed when they see the real thing. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really Jake Gyllenhaal, but when, once they get over that, you know, <laughs> oh. I know if anything I ever did turned into a movie, all my relatives for the rest of my life would be getting copies of this movie for every holiday and stuff of that nature. But was it, I mean, describe the feeling when you first watched it. It had to just been surreal. Well, um, in fact, um, watching the movie made, I, I, uh, it was to me just interesting to watch it being made. And I, and I kind of looked at it from that standpoint. I took a, step back and and we're just watching it from a technical way and so on but when i first saw the screening after it had been edited and everything i have to say that i was just shaking all over and uh i, I it surprised me i'm usually pretty calm and cool you know I, uh, i've been around, around a few times around the world and uh but um it i think i just got a sense of what and you know mark isham's wonderful music was uh, uh, yeah. put on top of it and um, the scenes were selected, and, and it all just flowed. And um, so, yeah, it um, I was just just shaking, and I don't know I don't know what the nerve was. It wasn't fright or it wasn't excitement. It was just something deep within me that that came out when I watched it. It's an emotional connection, I think, right? Because you're so yeah. you're passionate about it, it comes to life, and then it resonates off the screen, the sound, the expression yeah. of everything that's impacting you. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's the great thing about film. All of us could go sit in a theater and we all have a different reaction, but there's that emotional connection that just hits you deep within. And I think that's what that film did to millions of people. I know when, when yeah. I was a boy, it did that to me. You know, I ran yeah. outside and I, I started blowing up like rockets. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I even went and got one of those water rockets. Remember the water ones you pump up really oh, quick? Yeah, that, that was me. Water ones are good. I always, I get, I get, I've got many letters from kids. It's like, give me the formula of all that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Remember what uh, Elsie says in the movie, don't blow yourself up. You know? <laughs> no, no, go to a, a, a rocket club and, and learn how to do it safely and so on. I have to tell you, we're talking about audience reaction. Um, we went to the Venice Film Festival. Chad, I don't know what. I was I, I, yeah, I wasn't there for that. I, I know. And I'm sorry about that. I, That's I, right. I I I tried to get you there, I <laughs> but they only had a few seats in the private airplane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, next next time for the sequel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but, but at the Venice Film Festival, and um, Chris Cooper was over there. Oh uh, yeah. That's the first time I really got to, to 
she talked to Chris. He was very much into his uh, into his part, and therefore, as the father talking to the real son, wasn't exactly what he wanted to do. So I think he talked a little bit, but he really, but over in Venice, it was like, oh, here comes Chris Cooper. He's just like, oh my God, Homer, I love you, and blah, blah. you know, it's like, okay, what have you been drinking? But anyway, uh, so um, uh, but we eyes wide shut was the big movie, yeah. and uh, so Tom and Nicole. Sh- you know, they showed up and it's like, hey, Tom, hey, Nicole, what you doing? But anyway, uh, yeah, I'm home. Like, <laughs> I just kidding. We didn't meet him. We saw him go by. They, you know, it's like they had bodyguards. But anyway. Yeah, right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, they, so they showed Eyes Wide Shut and the Italian audience just clapped tepidly. And um, Tom and Nicole came out and they clapped tepidly for them and they went off. And then they showed October Sky. By then it was like midnight, but the Italians were still there. They're, you know, they stay up late. So they showed October Sky, and at the end of it, everybody got up and it they roared and they applauded and they kept going and going and going. And although we weren't scheduled to go up front, they they made us all stand up. Laura Dern was beside me. She was so excited. She was jumping up and down and she kissed me and uh, I'd almost Amazing. forget that part. But anyway, so, uh, <laughs> like, yeah, really. But anyway, <laughs> that was the reaction that we got. And, and and we just knew somehow, you know, it wasn't big box office. Where it really started right. to take off was after. Yeah. Uh, after that, when it when it started going into, you know, into people's homes and into the classrooms and so on. And it built and it built and it built. And you know what the the Academy Award winner, best movie of uh, 1999 was? Have you oh, Man, I'm sure I, when you say it, yeah, uh, was it Gladiator? No, it was American Beauty. That, now, oh, oh, I should know this. Spacey. I should, how many? Should, I thought that was 2000. <laughs> no. no, you're right. Because my, my, my oh, roommate right. at well, the time I pay attention was wet. To I, it's my job to pay attention to these things for you. Right. So, so American, <laughs> how many people care two cents about American Beauty? I mean, it's an, it was a good movie. Don't get me wrong, but nothing it, that didn't have any impact like October Sky or the legs. HBO, Showtime, all of them constantly show October Sky. Yeah, it's just amazing, you know. Really. So yeah, it's like, on and on. The first Starship that leaves our solar system. They're not going to have eyes wide shut on board. They're going to have. <laughs> We're going with them. Ted. We're going, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, you're right, though, like as far as like the audience reaction, like the way that you felt in inside you, like that's that's how it, I, I reacted. That's how, you know, my family reacted. You know, there's not a dry eye in the house when at the end of the movie you see Chris Cooper's arm go around Jake Gyllenhaal and put oh. it around him. You, there's not a dry eye in the house. And like, I mean, I have goosebumps talking about it. And I, you know, when we when I saw you last and we had the screening of October Sky, I literally, I think, cried the entire movie and the entire Q and A. Like I was <laughs> sobbing. I know. I know. We didn't know what to do with you, your little puddle. I was. <laughs> <laughs> the other boys. We had Roy Lee there, the real Roy Lee, and yes, uh, Odell. He's crazy, right? He's crazy. <laughs> uh, and um, and it was and uh, it was like what? And Billy. Billy's not in the movie. Uh, right. His character was a little bit combined with Quentin, but not much, but you know, they had to, they went from six boys down to four. Obviously you want to have four actors and six is, it's like, how can you fit six boys and give, I'll give them decent parts. So I understood that shrink them down uh, four. but anyway, they loved you and uh, they were sorry, but you were, you were so, uh, so much of a crybaby that night. But anyway, uh, yeah, I know <laughs> I was, man. Yeah, I was you were wonderful. I mean, everybody just loved you up there, Chad. And uh, they, everybody loves you everywhere, of course. And, uh, oh, your mom was on set and gosh, she's, she's such a beautiful woman. I'm, oh, thank you. Yeah. She's been watching these too. She'll be, she'll be uh, excited to, to hear that. I mean, we, and my family came down, spent time. I remember the real, like, like you were just talking about the real rocket boys showing up and, yeah, it was just something in the air, you know, it's just magical. And, and, you know, or, or the day when we were shooting the scene with the train, you know, and, and I think you were there for that. All the guys were there for that. I was on the train. 
Oh, and you were cool. on the train. That's yeah, right. I'll, yes, I'll tell you a quick, just real quick story. The engineer is O. Winston Link. Now, who's O. Winston Link? He's a famous railroad photographer that, that everybody who's a train buff know about, but nobody else does. Well, Joe Johnston is uh, he, the director is a huge train buff so he he wanted to have a real train in this movie and he wanted o winston link uh to be the uh the train engineer well when o winston o winston link he worked with his daughter and when but when mr link showed up mr link it turns out was well he wasn't he he kind of gone over the bend in a bit and, and mentally <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He was probably 112 years old, and so, um, <laughs> so um, my uh, I uh, I said, "What can I do to help Joe?" And and but Joe didn't. Joe just wandered off like he always does. But somebody, one of our uh, assistant director, said, "Homer, would you like to?" Uh, because well, I remember when the train went by, he uh, Mr. Link was supposed to wave. Remember? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> He kept forgetting to wave, and it's like pretty it's a real train. <laughs> and, and we're or, shooting with film I, back in those days uh, too. Yeah. Oh, can, yeah. So, so I said to the assistant director, "Can I get into the cab of this train and tell Mister Link when he's supposed to wave?" So I crawl on board. I'm down underneath. There was a woman who shoveled coal in the in, in the thing, and and. Uh, Get to, get to going with this great woman. She was magnificent. It's like, who are you? I just like, I love you, but I don't have time to mess with you right now. I got to take care of this. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so I was down on the floor. Oh, and the real engineer was also down on the floor with me, actually controlling this this locomotive. But we could kind of peek around the corner there. And so as we're coming up on the boys, my job was to reach up and. And pull Mr. Link's trousers, and he knew that if, when he was pulled on the trousers, he was supposed to go. That was a really good impression. <laughs> takes, uh, and but I couldn't hear anything for a week. Oh gosh, that thing was so loud. But I was down there just pulling Mr. Link's trousers for all this work, and he was just waving like. Why not, I'm supposed to do something now, you know. And so anyway, it it they got they got a shot that they could work with, and that was so much fun. And it's cool to meet Link, you know. I just wish I could have talked to him, but he wasn't talking to much anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Speaking of engineers, so you, you worked with NASA. Well, you worked for NASA, right? As an engineer, I did. I, um, I started working for NASA in 1981. I was 38 years old. Before I'm a Vietnam veteran, so during the during the um, during the Apollo years, I graduated from Virginia Tech uh, and uh, went off in the Army and ended up over Vietnam. So during on during the Apollo, I was doing that, but I always wanted to work for, for NASA. Uh, when I came back from Vietnam, the uh, actually time that Apollo about the same time, eight flew and went around the moon, and then the next year Apollo. 11. Um, they were actually years left, so I didn't really have a, a, a chance to work for them. But I went, I went to work as a civilian engineer for the Army Missile Command, which uh, is side by side with the Marshall Space Flight Center at NASA. So I kind of got my foot in the door on that. I got to know some of the folks over there. I actually went over to Germany, worked for the Army Training Command for a while, and NASA hired me while I was over there. So they brought me back just as the shuttle started to fly. So I had a great career. Um, I ended up, um, I, I was uh, uh, working on the space lab, which was um, a, a laboratory that fit in the back of the shuttle. Um, it was designed by NASA, but built over in Europe. So I got some trips over to, uh, to Germany and, and uh, Italy out of that. And um, then um, as, as that matured, I'd met a lot of the astronauts, and I, I was also working as a scuba instructor in the neutral buoyancy simulator. It's a great big tank where you go inside the suit and go underwater and you simulate weightlessness. And so uh, we, needed to, we needed to train the, we, the astronauts in space labs, so I ended up um, um, being a, an astronaut training manager for most of my career. I took that job. I like to say I took that job because I figured it'd be easy since astronauts already know everything, right? And <laughs> or they think they do. <laughs> uh. 
<laughs> I love that. I, I had a great career with him. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> Of course, uh, then this other side career with the, the writing uh, came along. And so it just turned out I was 55 years old. I had fed 30 years of federal service uh, in 19, uh, uh, it, it, actually in February of 99, um, that, um, that it was time for me to retire and, uh, and get busy with some other things. But I absolutely did love my time with NASA. It was great. Thank, thank you so much for your service, number one. And number two, what haven't you done? <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, I, just, yeah. I just worked for NASA, worked on the shuttle. You know? yeah. I, made, I, I made a hit film that like when <laughs> still talking about it today. I mean, man, I give you mad respect. Seriously. I mean, not a lot of people can do what you've done in your, your lifetime. It's incredible to just hear your stories. You know, number one, going to Vietnam, coming back, NASA working with them, working with the astronauts, training the astronauts, and making a, a film that's memorable. October Sky is an incredible film. And if people haven't seen it, go out, watch it right now, because it's one of the most epic films that I've seen, especially as a kid, too. Um, it, to me, it was adventurous, too. It was like discovering something. You know, you're going out, you're discovering something about yourself. But not only that, you're discovering something about your abilities and something that you can, like, you can do, I don't know, it's such an exploring type of film for me. I, I used to play up in the woods all the time in New England. So I grew up in New Hampshire and I would go out with, the, my parents took my matches away from me when I was a kid. So I couldn't <laughs> light any rockets on fire or I couldn't light anything on fire because <laughs> it's a little bit of a pyro in that sense. So I I was one of those kids, but I absolutely loved the film and it motivated me to go out and, you know, explore just explore, you know. I think that's what it was all about for me personally. I loved it. Well, thank you. It, um, it, you know, um, making film is an art form, but it's also very, very difficult. I, uh, I, I think a lot of people who never involved with a movie doesn't realize how hard everybody has to work. Uh, and when you see a movie that's really good, you, I, I can just tell you the people that that were in it and worked around it were very, very, very hard. And um, um, all the act- I mean, it was just uh, just think marvelous all the actors that, that ended up being in this movie, and um, they are family. Uh, Chad uh, Chad did such a great job, uh, took that part, and um, made it. You know, I think all the actors made their parts more more than than how they were written. Um, I know they did uh, because I saw it. I, you know, I read the, I read the screenplay and um, I, uh, at first I didn't like it. Now I love it. But at first I didn't, frankly. I mean, uh, no author likes a screenplay made out of a book. That's a fact. And he's like, just film every day. You know, that's the way. <laughs> but uh, Lewis Kulik did a marvelous job. Um, and, and then the actors, though, took, uh, took those lines and made them real. And uh, I mean, Chad uh, uh, just well. Chad had a very difficult part. His his part was a composite. It was Sherman Odell, yeah. two characters in one, and and sometimes Lewis wrote it for one character, and sometimes he wrote it for the other. Yeah. Um, Sherman had um, actually had polio, and um, they never, uh, for some reason, Lewis never put in a script that he had polio, and so it was like. Hey, Chad, you forgot the lamp. And it's like, well, <laughs> it's like, yeah, you, you were, and you are. And so, um, uh, so it's, it was, I, I, once Chad got it in his head, even though it wasn't in, in the, in the uh, screenplay that he had polio and he was supposed to lamp, he never forgot. He twisted that foot. It was just amazing to watch it. Cause I watched to see if he did it. And you always do. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, I put a lift in my shoe too, so I always had that uncomfortable feeling, and yeah. so every time it just it just made me kind of like have to like kind of limp anyway. So, yeah, uh, it, yeah, I, you know, it was cool because, I mean, it's also like, of course, like the story and of course the screenplay, but it was also the chemistry between the guys. And I I remember doing the screen test back in the day for that movie. And there were, Jake was already cast, but like there was probably two guys for each other character, except Chris. Chris was, I think Chris was cast and, um, and Jake, but for me and, and uh, Will, but they all put us together first. They wanted to see like their dream team first. And then they kind of like did the other guys. 
but that was it, you know, and then we got to Tennessee and, and, you know, they made us, you know, hang out for a while and, and we just went and went to Walmart and, and uh, <laughs> hung out. And then that's, there were real friendships there, you know, it was, it was authentic. And, yeah, I, I you know, you, my first major motion picture. Yeah. I, I think you maybe met for uh, close to the first time was at a Hampton Inn in Oak Ridge where, a friend of mine from high school, Emily Sue Buckberry, who was a, a speech therapy professor, had to teach you how to speak West yes. Virginia. Do you remember that? That's right. Yes. Yes, I do. I do. I do. I do. Um, yeah, we spent a lot of time going over the uh, the accent, and I remember the the one word to enter that we would go like use to like go into uh, the accent was was everything. You know what I mean? So we <laughs> with everything, but we wrote everything. So we would start there and then go out from there. And, I know. Uh, I remember. And then, Very yeah. good if you remember that. But I have to tell you, I never said everything in the entire history. <laughs> 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 Emily Sue might have said it, but I never did. <laughs> uh, that's funny. But, yeah, oh, uh, man. But it was just classic, and then and then the you know the guys we would just constantly just be in that voice, and we'd be cussing at each other. We'd be like, "Rolly, you sound bitch." Or Homer, you sound bitch. It was just. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, it was great. Um, oh, oh, oh! Uh, Natalie Kennedy played my mom. You remember her? And uh, oh yeah, yeah, she was in. Um, I'm trying to remember, but Sling Blade. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Did a great job in that. But my mom, the real Elsie Hickam, was quite the pill, I got to tell you. So um, she, my mom came on set. I don't know if you got a chance to meet her or not, Chad. But anyway, Natalie did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I said, uh, Mom, uh, here's, uh, here's uh, Natalie Kennedy. She's, she's playing in you, you in the movie. And my mom took a long look at her and she said, you know, I really wanted Kathy Bates. <laughs> so natalie got the idea oh. at that moment that maybe she ought to make this character a little tougher <laughs> yeah, i think i think at the time kathy bates was breaking kneecaps right yeah. 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 <laughs> natalie uh, we had natalie in colwood she came when it was still the festival was still there and uh, Chris Owen later came up to Beckley. I don't That's right. Know that. That's uh, right. Oh, Chris, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, yeah, yeah. Love him to death. And uh, uh, who else came um, up there? Um, uh, Scott Miles. You remember Scott? You, you didn't hang out with Scott very much. He played my brother, Jim. Brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember Scott. Yeah. 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 He's also a great actor. And Chris Ellis. He played Chris Ellis, Miles, the, the yeah. principal. Yeah, yeah. He came one time. So the, everybody that comes there, West Virginia, just love him to death. It's like, never leave. Please never leave. Um, by the way, I don't know if you noticed or not, but uh, West Virginia was the last one to get the, this thing that's going around. Yeah. And um, somebody put out uh, a T-shirt, great T-shirt. It said, West Virginia, we've been uh, social distancing since 1863. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> oh, my but, um, but, yeah, it's a great state, and uh, uh, people there are lovely, and uh, it's, uh, it's a good place to grow up, really. It really was. Yeah. I'm glad you got to, got to know a little bit of it when you were up there. Yeah, yeah. And I go back there often. I was just, uh, well, Nick, we were in, did we go to West Virginia or was it Virginia? It was, I think we were in West Virginia for the hospital, right? Or Or, no, just recently. Yeah, for the festival. It was in Virginia, Virginia. Virginia, okay. Western Virginia. Yeah, well, you know what? Um, West Virginians will forgive you for not realizing that uh, that we are a separate state. Yeah. <laughs> they won't forget, but they will forget. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's kind of it's kind of funny. Uh, uh, people, you know, you, they they go. You say, "Well, I'm from West Virginia," and they go, oh, "I've been to Richmond." Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yankees burned that down in the Civil War. We helped them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, what, was there anything in the film when it came out that didn't make it that you can share that you wish was in or, or got taken out for some reason? Uh, like um, well, not really, but I can tell you um, the scene that everybody remembers, 
uh, there's a lot of memorable scenes, but you mentioned it was the one where Chris Cooper puts his arm around Jake Gyllenhaal at the end and everybody just bursts into tears. It's designed to make you do that. And that's great. But in the book, it's written quite a bit differently. In fact, the boy puts his arm around the father. Oh, wow. Because the father is so excited at seeing the rocket go off that the black lung that's going to kill him kicks in and he starts coughing and he can't stop and he, he starts to stagger. And so the boy rushes over and puts his arm around him and tells him, it's okay, Dad. Nobody ever launched a better rocket than you. So when people read that book, they burst into tears. And so um, they, that part, the way it's written. And so I argued with Joe Johnston extensively that he was doing this all wrong. Um, but Joe stuck to his guns, and he was right. I mean, that would, that would have been, like, too complicated at the, at the end. Um, but you, you want to have a very dramatic um, – uh, ending and one that that just pulled at the heartstrings and th- and the way that he did it it absolutely worked that way yeah when you just told that part you know reading from your book it gave me goosebumps dude i had really. to too <laughs> i was like oh crap <laughs> it took something from your voice <laughs> oh, man. So, good, yeah. so good i'm gonna have to read the, i'm gonna have to read the book now yeah it's uh, i know that i'll be remembered for that book when i die it uh you know uh, the Charleston Gazette up in West Virginia might have a little headline and it'll say Homer Hickam, um, the author of uh, Rocket Boys, you know, October Sky. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or something, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, and they'll ignore everything else that I ever did. Oh. <laughs> I can live with that. I mean, it's such a, a good movie. It's, uh, you know, it's great. I, I, I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> what about some of the other work you've been working on? Is there anything else you would love to see adapted into a film uh, that you've written? Well, um, Sky of Stone, which is the sequel. There's, there's actually there's an equal called The Colwood Way, which is a Christmas story uh, that I that I was writing into the book that has the Rocket Boys in it, um, and um, uh, but that one is encapsulated in my, uh, or it was for a long time in the contract with Universal. So the time frame. So we couldn't do anything with that. So the sequel is Sky of Stone, where I actually uh, ended up um, while I was going to Virginia Tech during the summer, came back and worked for my dad in the coal mine all summer. And so that's the story of that. And that that did very well, and it's dramatic in its own right. Uh, and uh, Hallmark. Um, optioned it and was going to make a movie out of it. And then something happened and they never did. But now um, I've just recently heard from, um, from a producer, a serious producer about acquiring that uh, script that Hallmark made uh, and, um, and doing something with that. And so that'd be kind of nice. I'd like that. Uh, of course, I'd like carrying Albert home, the most recent uh, uh, novel, a true story of a man, his wife and her alligator. Um, and right. which did very well. I've had some interest in that. Um, and uh, so, you know, we'll see. Like I said, I've, I've had my Hollywood marathon kind of laid back about the whole thing. If you want to come <laughs> hey. And it's like, uh, uh, now I'm, I'm so laid, laid back. It's like, you know, uh, Homer, we're just gonna, we don't, we don't want you around. We're going to write this script any way you want to do. And I go, Cut me a check, buddy. (laughs) 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 It it is so true, though, how long the process is, you know, with film. It just it it was a different time back then, you know, with um, how they would do production and film and stuff like that. And Chad, you've seen it changed over the decade. We're both been in the business, you know, Mm -hmm. to down to mini DV tapes and then to high def and now 4k and 6k and 8k. It's like insane now yeah. that they're shooting on cameras that are smaller than, you know, like your cell phone that just have advanced lenses on it. It's just, it's amazing how technology has changed, but I feel too, you know, we're missing the story. Like it's all about the story. I don't care how big the production is, how awesome or cool or whatever the film is. If the story is not there, you don't have anything is my, my opinion. I mean, it's all about the story. And that's what October Sky had. 
Yeah, it really should be. And and um, when I start writing a book, I mean, that's what I want. I've got to write a book that makes you want to turn every page. And I, I'm cognizant of that. And so if I let my writing cool down. I go back and if I'm kind of bored reading it, I know everybody's going to be really bored reading it. So, um, <laughs> so, so I'm a good self-editor. I go back and just, I, I, I work and work and work and work to get this thing right. When I send it off to the publisher, I don't want to hear from the editor. Yeah. Uh, I wrote a, mm. one time I heard from an editor. I have to tell you, um, I had uh, Thomas Nelson, wonderful publisher. They're a Christian publisher and they got swallowed up by Harper Collins. But uh, before that, um, they, uh, w- which the Harper Collins brought out uh, Caring Albert Home. They're a great publisher. But um, anyway, Thomas Nelson had kind of, kind of some guidelines about things. And um, so I decided to write him this book called Red Helmet. And it's the story of this rich woman who ends up owning a coal mine. Um, the superintendent of the mine is her husband and they get estranged, blah, blah, blah. So, they're down in the coal mine. There's been a big explosion. The husband, the ex-husband now, um, gets his leg broken. And the woman, the heroine of this of my book, said, I will carry you out. I will get you out of here. And he said, no, no, I'm too heavy. You can't do it. And her response to that was, sure you can. You've been on top of me a lot of times. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Poor Thomas Nelson. Like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I fought for that line. I fought, I got I got that line. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I, I <got> that. <laughs> well, that's some of the things you have to get. <laughs> oh my God. I feel like what oh, more I'm, I'm, the world needs right now is is laughter like that, though. Laughter, you know, a lot of laughter. Yeah. Well, I agree. I mean, laughter is the best medicine, after all, really. You know, and uh, uh, and and I've been, uh, by the way, I've been reading uh, parts of Caring Albert Home, and also another true story. Uh, this would make a good movie too, called Paco the Cat Who Meowed in Space. True story. Um, about my cat Paco. Hey, come on, it's true. I like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you go out on Facebook or Twitter, I know I know Chad's been watching every one of them. I can tell. Yeah, you know, I look. You know, I can tell. I've got I've got analytics here. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> every one of the, I've been reading parts of Carrying Albert Home for all his shut ins over seventy. You know, and um, and also the most recent one, uh, Paco the Cat, you me out in space, which. Uh, which was a lot of fun to read. So I've been trying to do my part, make people laugh a little bit, because this is all going to end. It's all going to be over. Yeah. I reminded people when, during the Vietnam era, we didn't think that that day on Vietnam War was ever going to end. It went on and on and on. Then we had the Cold War. Yeah. We were going to lose that for sure, but it went on and on and on. Uh, NASA's had these act- horrible accidents, the Apollo fire, and yeah. a few years later we landed on the moon. Um, the Challenger, I knew all the crew of the Challenger. I mean, we didn't know we'd ever fly again, and it was horrible. And uh, But we did. But we came back in Columbia, too, later on. And so a lot of these things happen, and while they're happening, you think, well, we're, we're, we're trapped. We're not ever going to come out of this, yet we do. Uh, Mark Twain said that God looks after fools, drunks, and the United States of America. And I think he's right. Uh, so for some reason... <laughs> <laughs> God only knows. It's not. A, it's not. A, <laughs> we uh, we somehow uh, end up in. Uh, you know, we we do okay. Uh, so I'm I'm optimistic. It's so all gonna be good. Yeah. But um, uh, I, I, we are we're doing we're following the guidelines. I did go to the grocery store today. You got it. <laughs> yeah, I always get autograph requests. Do you? Yeah. Well, have, yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, okay, well, and they hand me a pen. And it's like, where's this pen been? <laughs> yeah. I had, I, I had that problem the other day. This this guy was waiting for me, and, and he was waiting for me inside the, the post office, and then I came out, and his hands were all sweaty. And oh, yeah. Awesome, and I, I realized in that moment, I'm like, I, I can't. I can't right now. I can't do the. I can't do the handshaking. No, no. We need. Well, you know, that's kind of outdated anyway. We do need the you know, fist bump. Fist yeah, bump. exactly. I agree. The bell, like they do in Japan. Never could get that down quite right when I was down there. Like, <laughs> I like that. I'm a fan of that. I'm, I, 
let's bring it. Let's let's have it here. I, I'm on board for for that. Well, yeah, it's a sign of respect and taking your yes, exactly. Good idea. Yeah, yeah. good idea. Don't track the germs in. You know, so uh, no, we're going to be fine. And if we're not, we, you know, the wife and I'll just die, and the cats will eat us. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my dad always says. My dad always says, if, if it's my time to go, bring me out to the woods, let the squirrels eat me. That's <laughs> awesome. That's what to do. I was 12. Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, that, that still give you nightmares, right? <laughs> no, I just, I think about it every day. I go down to the living room and I'm like, oh, still alive. All right, don't have to drag him out back yet. <laughs> no, we're all going to be fine. It's all going to work out. We'll look back on it. You know, it's good. Thing, the thing that happens. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. and you're a living legend of that, my friend. It's it's amazing to hear about your life story, everything you've seen, everything you've seen accomplished, and and been a part of accomplishing that, those big things. So, it's awesome to talk to people like well, you. Been, uh, your generation to take over now, exactly, yeah. and hope for a positive. You know, not only exactly. take over, take care of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any kids, so I depend on you. We're I got kids. you, Homer. You I got you. Papers that we we mailed them several times, and somehow they keep saying that uh, they come back um, uh, that you're no longer at the address. But we're going to keep trying. We've got the adoption. Right? You're going to adopt us, take care of us in our old age, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, actually okay. at, we're actually at your front door right now, Homer. <laughs> yeah. We're just sitting outside. <laughs> well, you know, come see the ghost anyway, right? Yeah. We, we've actually time traveled and we teleported. We created a teleportation <laughs> machine and boom, there we are. <laughs> By the way, we have some ghosts here in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, yeah, Sloss uh, Furnace. Sloss Furnace right there in Alabama. Well, that, there? Alabama's a, no, Alabama's a big state. It's real long. They were looking at <laughs> on the map. And we're way up north. And, <laughs> and there's a railroad depot there. I can tell you this. This is a true story. So there was these professional ghost hunters that, that came in and around Halloween, they were hired to come in and there's known that there was ghosts at this um, railroad de- depot that was uh, during the civil war. It was used as a hospital and both Confederate and union soldiers were brought in there. A lot of people died and right beside this Maple Hill cemetery, just filled with Confederates and unions and, and everything. And so I went to it, and, and uh, so we went into the old cars, and we were in the caboose, and, and we had the tape recorders, you know? And so we're talking, you know, if there are any ghosts, and I felt this presence. I really felt this presence. And I had my tape recorder, and I said, hey, how are you doing? And, you know, we're, we're, we're just, we just want to uh, hope that everything's okay with you and the war's over, and, and, and you can go on your spiritual journey. And so we carried them back. And um, then they, they played the tape recorder so you could hear the voices, right? The kind of whispery voices that happened. And on mine, it said, after I was saying, hey, how are you doing and everything, the voice said, I love you. Whoa. <laughs> a male voice. <laughs> wow. And so I thought about that for a while. And um, while the, the other people were playing theirs, I went back to that caboose. And I went in there and... Um, until I felt that presence and I said, well, I'm sure you're very nice. And I'd love to have coffee with you sometime, but I'm not on your team. Just want to. <laughs> 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 so I felt like, you know, that I'd done the right thing. I, I didn't want to, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't want to lead him on or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but that is interesting to me, though. Like somebody, I I am fascinated with the idea that, uh, like for example, somebody with your with your scientific background, right? Somebody who has worked where you have worked, and then talking about the potential existence of the afterlife, right? Because it's a hot and heavy subject in our field over here, you know, um, yeah. and it's so easily dismissible. No, no, no. Honestly, I believe it. Um, I mean, my mom wouldn't leave me alone if she died. I finally had to ask her to leave me alone. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Put out of my dreams. And, and, you know, I'd hear her voice. And it's like, no, you know, come on, mom. Um, if you didn't, if you didn't, if you didn't instruct me right while I was, while you were alive, I don't think you're going to do it now. It's too late. <laughs> it's too late now. <laughs> but, but honestly, I do feel that presence. 
and I think I'm very open to it. And sometimes I have to kind of close it down. I think I'm a little bit too open to it sometimes. Sure, sure. What do you What do you think's happening? Just from trying to, we, we're always going down the rabbit hole and we're theorizing, we're thinking outside the box. But that's what it's about as humans, right? To think and to learn from one another and communicate that information. You know, we have all sorts of different people that we've talked to with different ideas and stuff. But what do you what do you think happens? I mean, not just the broad stroke of like a perspective that you believe, but what do you think from a logical standpoint? Are we dealing with conscious thoughts? Are we dealing with energy manifesting or are we dealing with time where it's slipping through to our reality? I mean, what do you think is happening? I think we have a soul. There's something inside us that's more than ourselves. And uh, sometimes we that manifests itself and sometimes it doesn't. I think when we're worried and depressed and unhappy and all that, then our soul's not getting through. But when we're, when we feel good, when we, when we know that things are going to work out and that, uh, that ultimately there's there, for some reason, there's this pervasive good in the universe. When we recognize that, then our soul is talking to us. It's it's like, we're going to take care of you. It's going to be okay. Um, whether it's an angel or whatever, but there's something there. And I think that when we die, sometimes, I mean, the soul has a, has a journey to make. And sometimes that journey doesn't, for some reason, doesn't, it, it gets, maybe there's, there's something in the soul that, that is, it still has work to do on the earth. Or there's maybe something else, some reason that keeps it, holds it back. But I, I, I sincerely believe, I, there's no doubt in my mind, for some reason, that we have a spiritual uh, part to us that that, uh, that if you're open to it, you realize it's there and and you see it in other people. Um, and so, no, it's uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the there's physics, there's chemistry, there's biology, there's all that. Yeah, I'm a dinosaur hunter. I go out every summer and hunt dinosaurs. I found uh, two T Rexes so far. Um, and but you can sit there and you are holding something that's 65 million years old and there's a connection to it. When we have these students that are working on at a site and they're digging up a triceratops, I've seen these young paleontologists actually weep when they find uh, uh, bone scar or uh, teeth scars on the animal that, that they've come to know. And so there's this connection even across deep time with wow. uh, with other beings, 65 million years. And so uh, I think there is this great connection between us all, and that's where we're headed. We're, we're going to go back into that uh, connection. Um, but sometimes we get hung up, and that's, 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 when, that's when you guys do a, a service, I think, by going out and, and talking to these, uh, these souls that are hung up. Absolutely. And I think for all of us, it's the spiritual journey. I mean, that's what we're talking about, the spiritual journey, the journey in general of all of us individuals that go through our life, just like you have, and you're sharing it with us. And I'm I'm taking it in like a sponge. I mean, it's amazing, you know, thinking back when I was a little kid watching October Sky, then going outside, looking up at the stars, thinking about the universe, and then now growing and learning so much information, evolving my brain, and looking up at the stars and saying, wow, a lot has changed since, and the universe is much more vast than I thought it was when I was a little kid. Yeah. Yeah. But that imagination was there, but the brain yeah. has evolved to say, okay, what's the possibilities beyond that? Well, yeah. We can't comprehend yet, but there's something else. You're absolutely right. There's something to more than just, just dying, and that's it. You know, uh, it's, it's such an interesting world we live in. You know, when you start going down the rabbit hole with different realities, different dimensions that we know exist and different universes now looking like our universes, beyond universes, infinity to that star. So it's so vast, you know, and I think it just starts with an idea and it starts with communication like we're doing. But ultimately, we're all on our own journeys to get there. Yeah, I I think theologians and scientists should realize that there's only there are some things about this universe they will never know. Yeah, uh, I think about God and religion and everything that the theolo- theologians just will never know. We're not we're not meant to know it at this point. Meant to we know don't it. understand it. And the same thing about the universe. The scientists, no scientist will ever understand the universe in totality. We can theorize about it, but we don't really understand 
And so we, I think we all have to be a little bit humble, humble about that and uh, just realize that, accept it. And, uh, but to, to try to understand it is kind of fun sometimes. And, um, but it's also, it's very, uh, it makes you humble to, to, to imagine how this universe was created. And we hope that there was a purpose for creating it. And, um, and I, but I believe there is. And I think there's a, a purpose why we exist. We have brains bigger than we need. Yeah. Why do we have that? And why does part of that, it's like we appreciate it. Like when we see a beautiful flower, why do we appreciate that flower? We can't eat it. Well, maybe Chad does, but you know, most <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> anyway. Probably, you're probably right. <laughs> but, uh, so, so why do we have that quality? I mean, there's a reason for it. I'm convinced there's a reason why we appreciate um, beautiful things, and why we are tr- we try to understand it. Uh, and so, and and I think maybe that's if you want to just say God. Um, God created us so that we would appreciate what she did, right? And so that I think that that's part of, part of the equation. I do. Well said. Love it. Homer, thank you so much for talking with us. This has been an incredible conversation. I mean, I feel like we could go and hang out, all of us, and just – talk about all sorts of stuff, then light a rocket off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just know what I'll it actually yeah. work. I just have to tell you, it's nice. you know, kind of hollow inside. But. Oh, <laughs> the, the studio would love that. If we, we could did fix that. that. Right we could uh, fix that. Definitely. <laughs> no, you know, it's um, Homer. It really like, honestly, whenever I talk to you or see you, it brings me right back to, to why I even, you know, came to Hollywood and pursued my passions and my dreams like you inspire me and just your very being and the way that you talked and the way that you were like no we'll be fine like it really was really comforting and it, i think everybody needs to hear that right now so just thank you for making time for us oh my pleasure chad and um, I, I love you and i love you guys and um, um i hope that we all get together sometime for real you know it'd be great absolutely come to Huntsville. we'd love to have you we should oh, all absolutely it'll happen we yeah, I'm on, a, I'm on the board of Space Camp, and you guys would make great space campers. Oh, I want to do that amazing. so bad. Yes, I would love right. that. So, deal. Well, we're coming to Alabama, yes, and we got, I, we'll we'll find some guys for you and, and over at Space Camp. So, come on. All right, okay. <laughs> that's a deal. I'm sold. We're coming to Alabama. We're going to look for ghosts, and we're going to go into space at the same time. I love this. That's the deal. And we'll go out to dinner and have a nice dinner and and catch up. We'll do all that. Yes, yeah, crew Homer, out in space. All right. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Be safe out there. Take care. Bye. Take care, Homer. Right. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Homer. Oh man! Wow, guys! That was incredible. Wow. Freaking wow, man! <laughs> like, that was you, so. You cool. always know when we get off a conversation with somebody highly intelligent that has just <laughs> lived an incredible life that we just sit here and go, huh. Like, what do you even ask somebody <laughs> with a fucking resume <laughs> like that? Right? Like, come on, man. Yeah. Come on, man. I'm like, like oh, what? okay. NASA engineer, cool. <laughs> yeah, what? V- Vietnam <laughs> what? vet. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Thank you, man. Shit. And then it's just like, oh, yeah, by the way, I help the astronauts over here. Yeah. No, yeah. No, 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 I'm a scuba scuba diver, but I also train the scuba divers. Shit. And I help I would, build the shuttle for NASA. As he was talking, I was just thinking back of my life Dude, so far. <laughs> yes. I'm like, <laughs> I've I've done pick it up, Johnny. Pick it up. What I are you doing? <laughs> I played uh, one month. I ate nothing but corn dogs once. (laughs) That's about it. (laughs) And I don't dare add that to the conversation. Not yet. Maybe maybe somebody will make a movie of that someday. Never happening. I think we should make it. I think we need to make that movie. Never. Napoleon Dynamite was made. That's true, bro. That's true. I was was thinking of everything, everything he said. I'm like, Damn, man, I need to wake up earlier. I need to get more motivated. I need to start moving, just doing more. I need to like, move my ass, yes. Man, Dude. I just lived the life. Crazy. Yeah, and I, I appreciate just kind of how laid back he was. Gosh, just a bit laid back he was about our current situation. You know, yeah. he kind of has seen so much. 
you know, and it was it was comforting. It really was comforting to hear him talk about it in his perspective. And one thing that, that I don't think a lot of people know about Homer is he's got an amazing, wicked sense of humor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I picked up really quick. I didn't <laughs> yeah. know if he was serious at times or if yeah. like, it was so dry that I'm like, gotcha. Yeah. I, it was going over my head a couple of times, but no, I, I, I thought he was hilarious. He was great. I want to hang with him. It's I wanna... so bad. Go to space camp, scuba dive, and go look for ghosts. Sounds like a great yeah. combination. Johnny, we'll eat yeah, hot man. dogs, too, at the same time. <laughs> oh, dogs or whatever you, got. you know, one thing I've noticed with all of our guests, the, the one theme, they're the most humble, kindest people that I've ever talked to. Absolutely. And that brother. seems to be the ongoing theme with these very intelligent, successful people. Yeah. I agree. We, G's only hang out with humble people and real people. That's right. We don't put up with egos. <laughs> <laughs> no egos up and in. Uh, <laughs> he, he, hitting the G floor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna knock you the G out. <sighs> knock you the G out, guys. That was that was, was amazing. That was. was that was oh, that man. was and um you know that that yeah and I just yeah going back into my psyche there for a second that was pretty special. I mean he's always gonna represent something really special to me so. Yeah, uh, I thank you, G's, for for having on Homer Hickam, man. Yeah, thank you, man, for hooking that one up, and it was incredible speaking with him. Now, what I'm going to do is say goodnight to my dog that's wandering around because it's Puppy Appreciation Day, nice. and then I'm gonna pour a glass of wine, go lay down, and turn on October Sky. That's what's up, G's. I love you. G's out. G's out. G's out.